Now we're going to talk about sex. Shul selection. Natural selection is a very important concept, but people were constantly recognizing that there was a lot of weird and features that just didn't make sense. Like the peacock, he has a gigantic tail. It's so big in male peacocks that it's hard for them to fly. and It's hard for them to get away from predators. That does not make any sense in the light of natural selection. So to explain some of these features, Darwin came up with a different type of selection, sexual selection, which can be just as important and sometimes even more so. Sexual selection refers to the differential reproductive success within a single sex of a species. So now we're talking about selection that acts on males and females differently and is ultimately responsible for any differences we see between them. There are a couple different types of sexual selection. The first one is intra-sexual selection. Intra means within. So this is selection for traits in response to competition between members within one sex. So just males and males or just females and females. Usually this ends up being male-male competition, males competing with each other for access to females. The other type is intersexual selection. Inter means between. I know they sound very similar, but make sure that intra and intersexual selection are different things. So now we're talking about selection for traits that increase the likelihood of being chosen as a mate. So selection for something that increases your chance of being chosen as the one. Usually this ends up being female choice. Another important term is sexual dimorphism. Morph means form and di means two. So this means there are two different forms and sexual, that modifier means it's according to the sexes. So males are different than females. So and this just means any phenotypic difference between the sexes produced by sexual selection. In this picture here, we have our mandrels and you can see the male mandrel is about twice as big as that smaller female in the bottom. There are of course many similarities their fur is about the same color. They both have these bright things on their faces, but the male is a lot larger. He kind of has this mane around his head um, and his nose is much, much brighter, even though they have similar structures on their face. What's interesting is in different social systems, we see different types and levels of sexual dimorphism. So here on our left. Yeah, that, that's left. Uh, we have our polygynous social system and we actually see pretty big um, dimorphism. So our baboon, the male is much, much larger than the female. And he also has much larger canines than females because male baboons actively fight each other and bite each other to fight and protect their female harems. On the other side, on our right, we have our gibbons. So they have a monogamous system or similar to monogamy at least, and we actually don't see much sexual dimorphism between them at all. They're about the same size, shape, and they just both have canines because these are a territorial species, so they are both actively defending their home range from other gibbons. So some things we'll see in sexual selection are direct competition, and that means what you think it means, it's fighting. So here at the top, we have our gelatas. They have their lip flip. So they actually flip their upper lip and that's a sign of aggression because it's showing off their canines. I, I'm a little scared by that. Um, you see these two males here are fighting. Um, our baboon in the middle, he's just showing off those canines being like, hey, I'm big and bad, don't mess with me. And then at the bottom, we have two silverback gorillas aggressively fighting it out. Um, in zoos, you cannot house silverback gorillas together because that's what they'll do. <laughs> Direct competition is pretty easy to understand, but we do also see something else, indirect competition. So what do you think this means? How can males compete with each other indirectly for a female? This means they're competing via their sperm. So here we have a picture showing a chimpanzee brain and a testicle. You can see that their testicles are almost as large as their brains. Chimpanzees compete indirectly um, because many different males will mate with the same female. So it's actually the sperm inside her ovaries and fallopian tombs that are either fighting or racing to get to the egg first. Um, and you can see with this male chimp here, he has quite the set of balls on him. 
people like to um, debate whether or not there is um, competition, sperm competition in humans. It doesn't seem like it's likely if you can think of the size of human male testicles to that chimpanzee we just looked at, but some people do like to argue this. Um, but that is a course in and of itself. Um, one thing we do see a lot of is male advertising. Males are trying to make themselves very attractive to our females. So of course at the top, we have to talk about our mandrels with those beautiful faces they have. And in mandrels, the dominant male is the one with the brightest face colorings because that denotes that he has the highest level of hormones and is in top physical shape. And in the middle here, we have our gelatas. They spend most of their time sitting on the ground um, and are upright. So you can see their sexual symbol is actually right on their chest. They have this gorgeous little hourglass shape. Um, and then we here we have our vervet showing ourselves his blue balls. They kind of do that instinctively, as I learned when I was trying to eat lunch in Kenya. That's not how I needed to eat lunch. Mm -mm. Of course, another thing we do see is infanticide. And this, we do think, is a result of sexual selection. Um, unfortunately, we have observed in 17 different primate species, um, 12 different genera, that males will sometimes kill newborn infants. Um, this happens when it's a new male moving to a group, and he is specifically killing the infants of females that he knows those aren't his babies because he is new. And this means the female is, will be ovulating sooner and will be available to have his child more quickly. It's not pretty but evolution isn't nice. Evolution sometimes comes up with some pretty horrible results. But we already talked about the fact that males in general are competing for females and females are usually choosing males. So what do you think that is? Hmm. What this tends to boil down to is reproductive potential. Males compete, uh, are, pretty much only limited by the number of mates they can get access to. They can just have a lot of offspring. Think Genghis Khan. Females, however, we are not able to have nearly as many children, especially when we're talking about talking about um, mammals here. Um, if you increase the number of mates we have access to, we're probably not gonna have that many more children. What this really boils down to is the difference between the egg and the sperm. You can see the egg here is so much larger than the sperm. Um, it is costly. It takes a lot more metabolism. And especially when we're talking about mammals with internal pregnancy, that is a huge investment. Male sperm, on the other hand, they are small, tiny, and cheap. So now we can think of this as in terms of reproductive investment, how much energy and time uh, males and females um, invest into reproduction and their offspring. So in general, sperm are cheap and they are constantly being manufactured. Um, males are just constantly churning out new sperm. Um, female eggs, on the other hand, they are very metabolically expensive. And at least when we're talking about mammals, they are in limited supply. When um, mammalian females are born, we have all of the eggs that we are ever going to have in our lifetime. And actually that just continues to <laughs> reduce um, as we go through our life. So in this sense, females have to be much more choosy about where they dedicate those eggs to. And males were like, well, doesn't matter if I lose a couple sperm, I'll just make some more. So you might be wondering, does sexual selection reinforce traditional gender roles? All of the things we just said do kind of allude to that, but that is an overly simplistic view. There are many other factors which relate to um, how we can invest. And especially when we're looking at human mating patterns, human females only seek males with more economic power when they're in societies where they don't have the same earning potential as men. When we look at hu um, female human mate preference in societies that are much more egalitarian, female preferences shift. So we only see this... Uh, adherence to traditional gender roles when we are actively suppressing women. So how about we don't do that? The biggest departure we see from these traditional gender roles is when we see a large amount of parental investment. So imagine if an infant needs a lot of parental investment to survive, well, it doesn't matter for a male how many partners he has access to. Because if he just inseminates a bunch of women, has a bunch of babies, but doesn't help in caring for them and they all die, well, then 
all of that investment means nothing. So especially in primates where we have to help raise our young actively, especially for humans, that's where we start to see more egalitarian um, sexual roles, especially when we're talking about other primates, there isn't, we don't see, you know, gender happen. Um, but that's why we see a little bit more equality between the sexes when we're talking about species that have to invest in their offspring. So here we can see our pygmy marmosets, chimpanzees, and our ring-tailed lemur. So what's sexual selection? And what are the different components within it? 